Hi students, this is Dr. Arindam and from today we will be starting yet another exciting series that is the Justify series part 1. You know in all MBBS questions or MBDS questions or whatever you are attempting, especially in biochemistry, there will be one series of lectures where there will be a Justify type of questions. Those are compulsory, you won't have any alternative. And there will be a statement, there will be a biochemical uh, phrase that you need to justify biochemically, right? So, in today's video, we will be starting with these five justifications and as long as the series continues, we will be covering almost all the justification questions that uh, can come and that has been featured in various examinations across many major universities, right? So, for today, we will be discussing five very important that covers various chapters. Number one, glucose can be converted to fatty acid, but the fatty acid cannot be converted to glucose in human. All right, it can be uh, represented in other way. Glucose can be converted to fat, and fat cannot be converted to carbohydrate. So carbohydrate to fat, but not fat to carbohydrate. The next is glucose six phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency (G six PD) deficiency leads to hemolytic anemia. Myoglobin does not inhibit Bohr effect. TCA cycle is amphibolic in nature and lastly vials for collecting blood glucose estimation contains fluoride or sodium fluoride or NAF. Now the timestamps are given for each of these answers so if you happen to know any answer you can jolly well skip this video and go to the place where you need to find your desired answer. So let's start. So let's start with the first question how glucose can be converted to fatty acid but not vice versa. Remember all of these answers should be very brief and to the point and should contain the exact biochemical explanation. So, we all know that glucose is converted to pyruvate by glycolysis and then pyruvate is converted to acetyl coenzyme A with the help of the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Okay, it's a complex enzyme that has got three enzymes and five coenzymes. We all know that, but that enzyme is irreversible, right? Now, pyruvate can be converted to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-coenzyme A is the precursor of fatty acid synthesis, right? Acetyl-CoA carboxylase then acts on acetyl-coenzyme A and then fatty acids can be formed. But since this reaction is irreversible, even if fatty acids are beta-oxidized back to acetyl-coenzyme A, acetyl-CoA cannot be converted back to pyruvate. So, the answer of this question is simply a one-liner answer that is pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction is not reversible. If asked in viva, you have to answer this, all right? And if asked in theory, you have to write uh, in brief that glucose is converted to pyruvate and pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A, acetyl coenzyme A to fatty acids. However, since this reaction is irreversible, though acetyl CoA cannot be converted back to pyruvate and then you get your answer, right? So, key word is PDH complex reaction that is pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A is not reversible. Now on to the next question, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. G6PD is an enzyme of pentose phosphate pathway or HMP shunt, right? It converts glucose 6-phosphate to 6-phosphogluconolactone, okay? This is the first reaction of HMP shunt, right? This is one of the most important reaction of HMP shunt. The first reaction is hexokinase reaction, right? So, the first rate limiting reaction is this and then what happens in this reaction, there is a production of NADPH, okay? NADPH is produced via G6PD reaction. Now, this NADPH helps in maintenance of reduced glutathione or it helps in reduction of glutathione, okay? Reduction of glutathione or reduced glutathione helps to tackle all the free radical damages in the body and by preventing the action of free radicals, it protects the RBC membranes. Now, that is normal, right? So, NADPH produced from G6PD reaction it helps to maintain reduced glutathione level and reduced glutathione prevents free radical injury to the membranes. But if G6PD is deficient, right, so there will be reduced production of NADPH, right. 
if there is a reduced production of NADPH, there will not be any reduction of glutathione and reduced glutathione will not be able to protect the membranes from free radical injuries. So, all the reactive oxygen species like superoxide ion, right, hydrogen peroxide, all those things will attack the RBC membranes and they will cause hemolysis. So, this thing can also come in another way. The G6PD deficiency patients have got hemolysis on addition or on administration of an anti-malarial drug that is primaquine. Okay? Similar mechanism, same thing. Primaquine adds to the oxidative damage. So, since there is more oxidative damage, we need much more reduced glutathione to protect that. But there will be no reduced glutathione as there will be no NADPH because G6PD is deficient. That is the main source of NADPH in the body. Other sources are malic enzyme, but that is a very small source of NADPH. So, soon malic enzyme will get the malic availability of NADPH from malic enzyme will be unavailable and G6PD deficiency will show up and that will lead to hemolysis. So, over here the answer is no NADPH, no reduced glutathione, no prevention of free radical damage and then hemolysis. The next one, myoglobin does not inhibit Bohr effect. Now, what is Bohr effect? It is the effect of H plus okay, or the pH that alters the oxygen binding capacity of hemoglobin. All right. Low pH facilitates oxygen dissociation. All right. Anyways, but you need to know one thing. First, how low pH affects hemoglobin? Okay, Because this thing can also come other way around. That is, hemoglobin exhibits Bohr effect. Right. So, you need to explain that since hemoglobin is a tetramer, it shows, uh, it has got two states, one taut form and one relaxed form, that is T state and R state. And binding of one molecule of hemoglobin increases the oxygen binding capacity of that other molecule of hemoglobin, that is known as cooperative activity. And this whole tetramer of hemoglobin shows allosteric activity and it can be influenced by factors like change in pH. Okay, so that is in case of hemoglobin, mind it. However, myoglobin has got no such tetramer, it is a single molecule, right? So, it has no cooperative findings so or it has no cooperative ability to bind oxygen. So, you know, the curve, oxygen binding curve of hemoglobin looks like this, okay, it looks like an S, similarly like allosteric enzyme, but in case of myoglobin, it is an hyperbola, it looks like this, right? So, the answer to this question, specifically in case of myoglobin, will be myoglobin is a single molecule. It has no cooperative binding of oxygen. Hence, it shows zero allosteric activity. And it is not possible for any enzyme other than an allosteric enzyme to be affected by change in pH. Therefore, the oxygen binding capacity of myoglobin will not be affected by change in pH. Hence, myoglobin will not exert any Bohr effect. Remember, the keyword is myoglobin is a monomer, no tetramer, no cooperative binding, no allosteric activity, therefore, no effect on pH. I mean, pH has no effect on myoglobin, therefore, no effect of pH, so no Bohr effect. The next one, TCA cycle is amphibolic in nature. Now, by the word amphibolic, we mean catabolic and anabolic, right? So, TCA cycle is one such cycle or one such pathway that has got both catabolic and anabolic features. Mind it, in all of these questions, you need to give a schematic diagram. I mean the box and flow diagram. But in case of TCA cycle, you can uh, elaborate the TCA cycle steps if you have got some time and then you can easily explain the amphibolic nature. So, I have given you one figure of TCA cycle, you can draw it in your own way. There are hundreds of different varieties of uh, figures, both have the same thing. Every th one, every diagram has got the same substance. It has got the enzyme, it has got the product and the uh, reducing equivalents that are produced in TCA cycle. Now, from here you can see, first let us look at the catabolic nature. Now, by the catabolic nature, we mean the production of energy. So, the energy that is stored in acetyl-CoA is actually released in the form of NADH, FADH2, GTP, 
all right so all of these are the catabolic steps or the catabolic nature it denotes the catabolic nature of tca cycle so number one production of energy by the reducing equivalence like atp gtp nadh and fadh2 indicates the catabolic nature of tca cycle next we need to look at the anabolic nature of the tca cycle and by the anabolic nature we mean the intermediates of tca cycle are actually precursor to many building blocks so that is the synthetic part catabolism is the degradation part so uh, what are the precursors and from here what else can be synthesized see uh, alpha ketoglutarate and oxaloacetate both of them can be transaminated to form amino acid so from here amino acid from here amino acid by transamination right succinyl coa succinyl coa and glycine can lead to production of porphyrins right hemoglobin <laughs> malate can actually form glucose citrate can form cholesterol as well as fatty acids so multiple things are being produced so from citrate from alpha ketoglutarate from succinyl coa from malate from oxaloacetate so that is the answer of this question tca cycle acts in production of energy that is the catabolic part it helps in degradation of acetyl coa to produce reducing equivalent that produces energy right atp that is the catabolic part and these precursors form intermediate of various synthetic building blocks that is the anabolic part hence since it shows both catabolic and anabolic properties tca cycle is also known as amphibolic cycle and lastly vials for collecting blood glucose estimation contains sodium fluoride right so here we need to understand one very important thing when we uh, store blood or for any investigation blood is not immediately uh, drawn and put into the machine right it is stored for some time especially in case of periphery where we collect blood samples from far away and it has to wait for few hours before it's getting analyzed in the chemistry analyzer in the process it was found out that glucose level used to dip okay glucose level is to get down and there was false values of glucose and that altered the diagnostic purpose of this test imagine a patient who has blood glucose level of 130 fasting blood glucose level right so definitely he or she is diabetic as we know above 126 but in course of time blood glucose level can come down 10 20 depending on how many hours it is standing so a diabetic value can be easily falsely reported as a non-diabetic right but we don't want that so in order to maintain the absolute glucose value we often add sodium fluoride in the vial so how does it act now first you need to understand why this glucose level comes down now in blood right there are plenty of rbc's and rbc's are non-nucleated cells that has got only cytoplasm and what step of carbohydrate metabolism happens in cytoplasm that is glycolysis so glycolysis will continue to happen after even after the blood is detached from the body right whenever it is in the vials and what will happen glycolysis will convert glucose to pyruvate and the glucose level will come down mind it there will be no tca cycle right because there is nothing other than cytoplasm and uh, tca cycle doesn't happen in cytoplasm so if somehow we can stop the glycolysis from happening then blood glucose will not be utilized and that is the exact mechanism what we are achieving by adding sodium fluoride sodium fluoride or fluoride any fluoride for that matter inhibits the enzyme enolase enolase is an enzyme of glycolysis it converts phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate so if we add sodium fluoride we inhibit enolase we inhibit glycolysis then glucose will not be utilized but you can ask the question why sodium fluoride there are multiple steps in glycolysis and those can also be inhibited yes there are multiple glycolytic inhibitors but this sodium fluoride is very cheap okay it doesn't react with any other enzymes right so it doesn't interfere with the analysis steps uh, blood glucose is analyzed in multiple ways hexokinase method uh, glucose oxidase peroxidase method these those enzymes should not be inhibited right otherwise we cannot measure blood glucose so sodium fluoride since it inhibits, inhibits enolase only it will not hamper with the assay of blood glucose on but cyber side it will stop glycolysis so number one it's inexpensive it's a very efficient inhibitor and 
sodium fluoride to certain extent it also acts as an anticoagulant right fluoride has got some anticoagulant value so it's three in one but the key the major answer will be sodium fluoride inhibits enolase enzyme enolase stops glycolysis the inhibition of enolase stops glycolysis and rbcs cannot utilize the blood glucose by glycolysis and then that's why blood glucose level will remain normal and that's why sodium fluoride is used in glucose estimation while the vials are being transmitted for blood glucose analysis so student that was it i don't want to stretch this video much right i'll be back very soon with another video of the justify series but just let me know how you like this video if you want this type of video please let me know in the comment section and if you're watching this video till now please type the word amphibolic in the comment if you do this i will be knowing that if you have liked my video and you are enjoying my video and you want more and definitely since these are very important for exam perspective i'll be definitely bringing back more of this content very soon so all the best for your exam remember to study all the three subjects anatomy physiology and biochemistry because your goal is to pass in all the three subjects in first attempt anyways i'll see you very soon till then bye and take care